Thank you everyone for coming this afternoon, and thank you for joining us today with our wonderful panel to talk about how the next generation of DNA synthesis and, and supply is going to unlock the future of the life sciences and healthcare. On stage with me, we have Matt Hill, CEO and founder of Elegy, Tim Lou, CEO and founder of Senti Biosciences, Patrick Boyle, head of code base at Ginkgo, Jake Beecraft, CEO and founder of Strand Therapeutics, and Christina Butterfield, director at Metagenome. Matt, you want to kick us off with a brief introduction of yourself and Elegy? Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Chris. Um, so, uh, I'm a reformed diagnostician, so I was previously at a diagnostics company for a number of years, uh, and then founded Elegy in 20, 2016, early 2017, uh, with a real mission to solve this DNA supply problem. I had been watching the field for a number of years and basically came to the conclusion that this is one of the key things actually holding us back from really realizing this revolution around synthetic biology that we've all been really thinking about, almost fantasizing about for more than a decade. So. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. Tim Liu, uh, synthetic biologist for quite a while. Uh, used to be at MIT, I'm faculty there, and uh, started from the point where synthesis didn't really exist very well to the point now is to transform the way we do things. Uh, currently at SentiBio, where we're using this technology to create smarter cell and gene therapies, with the idea that we can build cells, for example, that can do logic, hunt down cancer cells, protect healthy cells uh, as uh, better people. Uh, of course, I'm uh, Patrick Boyle. I've been at Ginkgo for uh, almost 11 years now, and I was a uh, you know student uh, synthetic biology before that. And you know, my first role at Ginkgo is actually building out what we call our design team. And basically, the approach we took was thinking about like, what if um, basically you could design any sequence you wanted, you kind of just trusted you had the right technique to make that DNA available to the team. How, how would you scale that? So, you know, my kind of synthetic biology journey started as coming in as a grad student uh, into Ginkgo, where I had spent six years doing a PhD. I uh, designed and synthesized six genes during that time, uh, which was quite the achievement. It was very expensive, had to get signed off from my advisor hand designed those genes in Microsoft Word, um, you know, <laughs> since then, yeah, it was a style at the time, yeah. um, you know, since then we built, built a very good software stack where we have API endpoints to deal with a lot of our suppliers going to generate tens of thousands of genes on a monthly basis, right? So, you know, for me, like, that's about 10 years of, of evolution in synthetic biology, and I think a, a lot of the field is just kind of waking up to that possibility and excited to talk more about that with everyone today. My name's, <laughs> my name's Jake uh, Beecraft, co-founder and CEO of Strand Therapeutics. We are a next generation uh, mRNA therapeutics company using uh, the tools of synthetic biology, genetic circuits, controllable nucleotides, um, to actually revolutionize and, and augment the way that we develop messenger RNA therapeutics in order to expand their therapeutic index, to expand their use cases, really go beyond vaccines, go beyond liver delivery, and actually deliver that in tissues. I'd say this is probably the first time I've been on a panel where, as a synthetic biologist, who I feel like I've been in the field for a decently long enough time, I'm actually probably, especially for you two, uh, less than both of you in uh, synthetic biology. I actually interviewed with Tim at MIT uh, 10 years ago, so. <laughs> 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 yeah. You were very young. I think you were like my age and on track right there, so yeah. Um, but yeah, this is fun. Round us off, Sure. I'm Christina Butterfield, Senior Director of uh, Biochemistry at Metagenomi. Um, so my passion in life is biology and uncovering uh, novel uh, diversity. Um, so I'm always in awe of nature, right? Ever since I was a kid, you know, animals, nature's how, how do things work and just exploring nature, right? So in grad school, I studied biochemistry and environmental organism that oxidize manganese. So it really endeared me to the strange chemistry that I can find in nature. In, uh, as a postdoc, I went to Jill Benfield's uh, lab at UC Berkeley, uh, where I studied uh, environmental genomics and uh, closed some genomes from soil, which was fun. Uh, but at, you know, at UC Berkeley, we launched uh, Metagenomy to really capitalize on the depth and breadth of diversity from the natural environment. We sequence DNA, we reconstruct genomes, and use AI and uh, big data science uh, to explore uh, 400 terabytes of data and uncover thousands of new CRISPR uh, tools and uh, apply new gene editing tools uh, to in vivo. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, everyone. I think, based on what we're hearing, it's pretty fair to say you've not only been in the space for a while, but maybe even take a step back and say, this era of synthetic biology really became, began with our ability to 
manipulate DNA. So Matt, as our resident expert, do you want to give us a brief I don't know, these, these guys have been this longer than I have, but you know, I think it actually starts with Paul Berg, right, in 73, right, 71, 73, where he did the first, basically the first recombinant DNA, and then Cook, um, Stan Cohen and Herbert Boyer put those into the E. coli cell to replicate. That was right there in the beginning, and that was 73, and that sort of kicked off the, the big revolution, I think, in recombinant DNA. Then there's a long, you know, I think uh, the way I view it is a long, slow build up to, I think, where we are today. We'll get to that. But I think the first, you know, obviously PCR came out in the early 80s. The first oligosynthesizers started, you know, short oligosynthesizers for PCR radiations, for PCR primers started to come online in the late 80s. Jim Hudson, for example, and Rez Chen, uh, research genetics. Um, and then all of those were pretty much all you could get until late 90s. Then people started the early days of gene synthesis, gene production, putting all those together to make genes. Uh, and, uh, I wasn't there, I wasn't in the field, but I know some of the folks may have been involved in iGEM competitions. I don't know if anyone has a history that they want to recap. That was great starting a synthetic biology lab around iGEM back yeah. when I was. In 2010 or so, yeah. back as an undergraduate. So, yeah. So, and that was my sort of uh, diagnostics period. So I was I was off doing other things, uh, but got very excited and started coming to Symbio Bay. That's it. Mm -hmm. 2014, time frame, and hearing the story about synthetic biology and where it's all going, and of course with the genomics revolution in the early 2000s. Right, I think that view and that lens on genomes. I think it really kicked off this era of, hey, what if we could program biology? And, and, and this is why we're here today, which is where are the tools that actually allow us to do this in a really scalable way? And I think they still don't exist the way they exist. And that's one of the reasons I look at this, is, uh, is to try to make headway in this, in this era. So it sounds like we've come a long way from six genes over the course of a PhD. But Maybe we can talk a little bit more about that, taking things a step further, and draw on your own backgrounds that are both complementary, as you were saying, all symbiofocused, but also very different. And hear from you all in your experiences how the supply of synthetic DNA has really changed. Maybe over the course of your career. Christina, do you want to kick us off this thing? Sure. Um, so let's see. When at the beginning of my career, I did agree it's it's all while ago. And uh, when we're studying, you know, from environmental microbiology background. Um, we couldn't synthesize every gene we wanted were interested in. And often when we're doing functional genomics approach, it's amplifying through physical DNA. So using degenerate primers to target genomes of as many organisms as we could, pull them out and learn about them. And that's where the field was for a really long time. Um, and even with metagenomics as using, really using uh, short read NGS um, to then stitch together pieces of entire metagenomes um, we still couldn't synthesize uh, those uh, those genes. It was, it's been, you know, over the course of my career, a uh, really fabulous kind of complement that technology is building with this massive uh, sequencing depth that we're able to achieve. And yeah, I would, I would, yeah, as a biochemist who loves to get her hands on new proteins, like the the pace at which we're able to synthesize the DNA, get the proteins out, study them, engineer them, is like frustrating. Um, so uh, we, you know, at least are now able to uh, synthesize genes in within um, a couple of weeks. Uh, be able to use them in the lab. Um, it's still too slow for protein engineering. We're trying to keep up in terms of and push ahead in CRISPR gene editing. We want um, new, very large tools uh, in terms of the size of genes and to get them synthesized is, a, is still a struggle. But we use utilize. Uh, as high throughput as we can, um, gene synthesis and all of the libraries is huge for us, uh, obviously in the CRISPR space, um, and variant libraries for protein engineering. So we're using anything and everything. I would say. Um, so it's we're we're kind of right with uh, you know the DNA synthesis space. We're super demanding. You know, we use we use every tool available. And you're building a lot of these tools in-house as well, in addition to leveraging external supply. 
Yeah, we're uh, we're building all new CRISPR tools, right? So nature is is evolved uh, all kinds of genetic uh, tools um, to reconfigure, reprogram DNA. Yeah, I think that, you know, it's a theme that we keep hearing is like, okay, like for DNA synthesis, everyone wants to be faster, more scalable, and cheaper all at the same time, right? And I think, you know, part of that is like, there's this like unlimited demand for DNA synthesis if you could like get it, you know, cheaper, faster, you know, um, lar larger scale. It's kind of, you know, we're still in the age of, you know, we made a lot of progress, but, you know, imagine, um, you know, learning programming for, for the first time, you have to pay for every, you know, bit that you're entering into, um, you know, into your Python, you know, IDE, right? I think there's that, you know, we're still thinking in terms of, oh, I wish I could get this one week faster because like, then I can do this next experiment. But like things really unlock once we reach those next um, kind of levels of scale because we're still, you know, you're still thinking about how much every base pair costs at this point. I would actually talk about DNA supply in one other lens that I think is important and it's become important for us as a, even as a messenger RNA company in the last couple of years. So research scale DNA, scale, supply, uh, uh, throughput, everything. I mean, it's been a revolution. Like you're talking about cloning six genes in grad school. When I was in graduate school, we had a couple more tools than that, but I mean, it was still you know, it's still not uh, like it is today when you get all of this research scale DNA. But the other part that I think is still sort of like woefully in that is the supply of high quality DNA for actual like clinical scale studies. So um, one of the things that we found at Strand very early on in our process development work, um, just a little bit of background, mRNA drugs, including the mRNA vaccines, they're all made from a DNA template. They're not synthesized as mRNA. So you make DNA and you do a bunch of stuff to that and you basically in vitro transcribe that with a bunch of enzymes like T7 polymerase into messenger RNA and then you purify that. One of the things that we found uh, pretty early on was that the mRNA quality that we got out at the end was highly dependent on the DNA quality that went into the system, which you could say makes sense, but then when you think about like it, it it's not actually that obvious that it will. Like you, you think like oh, I just need like the template. It doesn't matter what else is there, right? I mean, if I just have the template to read, but it turns out that it does, and it does very much. And one of the things that I was sort of shocked to find was that the vast majority of DNA-based therapeutics, whether it's making viruses, whether it's synthetic DNA, whether it's synthetic messenger RNA are made by just scaled up, quote unquote, cleaner versions of bacterial scale up that we were doing in our lab, right? I mean, it, it, for, for instance, if you do molecular cloning in a lab, right, you take a plasmid, you put it in a bacterial cell, you grow it overnight, you mini prep it, it's purified, like, and you call that pure. And then you're like, okay, well, but if I was going to turn this into a drug, it would be a different process. And like it is. But, it, but it's not. Like, it's still the same. Th I was sort of blown away by that, that there wasn't, like, a different, fancier system that companies used. Um, and what we found is that, like, there's a lot of suppliers out there supplying DNA like that, a lot of GMP manufacturers supplying DNA like that, and they're completely not treated, like, uh, created equally, right? They, they bring all sorts of different qualities, all sorts of different downstream um, products result from that. And the variability that you get in your clinical-grade materials is, like, unacceptable like to me to, to as an engineer to look at it and say wow like these are all companies that are created equally in my head if i'm like oh those are all trusted companies they're all making therapeutics that go to the clinic and then we have such huge variability and so i think there's just so much room to grow in next gen dna production capabilities that are going to be easier to scale that are going to be cleaner there's all sorts of non- uh, bacterial-based production systems now that we see from some of these next-gen companies. That I find super exciting because, um, I mean, if you zoom in at, like, Sarepta, one of the first gene therapy companies to really make it big, right, multiple times that company has almost fallen apart because of manufacturing issues, including most recently, right? Manufacturing issues hurt them, and a lot of that happened because of DNA supply chain. It's sort of <coughs> insane. I don't think we talk about it enough, and I love that there are more companies working on it. Sorry, okay, off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, we're trying to solve these problems. So. Yeah. Well, and, you know, for those manufacturing issues, those like came to play during the pandemic, right? You know, yeah. you know, remember Operation Warp Speed getting up to speed on like how to actually scale these MRA thera therapeutics. They're like, okay, do we need more bioreactor bags, et cetera? It's like, no, you need to go look at the process, right? Because like, you know, all these CDMOs are built around supporting clinical trials, and all of a sudden you can make oh. billions of doses. And, yeah. Um,
I got kicked off Operation Warp Speed yeah. uh, as an advisor for talking shit on CNBC about the fact that they refused <laughs> to give money to more CDMOs. Yeah. Because yeah. they weren't get they they were like giving money to Moderna, which is great. They're giving money to uh, well, they weren't giving money to Pfizer. They're giving money to like these different vaccine developers, and then they we got a vaccine, and then we couldn't figure out how to make it. And then they're like, oh, well, like repeal the patents. I was like, that's not the problem. You don't have a supply chain. You have a completely insufficient, uh, un unevolved supply chain now. Yeah. And they didn't. Well, you asked what that though. That was good. All hands on that. <laughs> <laughs> that infrastructure piece is really important. Totally agree. And it's, it's been very challenging as a CEO of a company that's trying to build this kind of capability. I talk to customers like every day. We hear, we hear the you know, voice of customers loud and clear. But it is challenging. It's not a sexy business, it's not the therapeutic itself. Right? So it's, it's, it's pretty challenging to get people excited about building this. Well, it sounds like we have some four very excited <laughs> people right here, and hopefully a few more in our audience. Uh, and to keep that conversation going, especially about scale, Patrick, you were leading the team in Ginkgo that designed all the <coughs> DNA for your gigabit scale on and twice. And so maybe we'd love to hear a little bit more about that, the yeah. challenges, the successes uh, that you've had in sort of putting DNA synthesis into use on the yeah. platform. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it was actually. Yeah, because it must have been five or six years ago at SymbioBanner where we announced that billing based pair contract. I think people thought we were kind of crazy at the time. We've since re upped you know, our, our contract with, with Twist. And, you know, part of the um, part of the reasoning there is like, you know, we were building this uh, large scale foundry to serve a large number of companies in very different spaces, right? So we're serving agriculture, pharma, industrial biotech, many of the companies here we, we work with. Um, so, you know, for us, we can't have a specialized pipeline for each. Kind of project that we that we do, right? So you know, think about DNA synthesis as like the raw design capacity moving moving into into the facility. Um, so you know, the partnership with with Twist, like basically by like setting those targets around you know hitting a billion base pairs, like one, it helped us like live in the future in terms of how we we're thinking about thinking about scale, right? So so in other words, rather than kind of like building it piecemeal, we just said like. What does the infrastructure and platform you need to um, to build a billion pay base pairs look like, and how can we turn that into a roadmap? And like, you know, very good to borrow lessons from other areas of technology, mm -hmm. right? I think the semiconductor industry did this really well with Moore's law. Is basically, you know, if you know that semiconductors are going to get better in eighteen months as a software developer, you can plan your roadmap around that. You can work on a piece of software today that will run on the computers that come out two years from now, right? Um, we approach DNA synthesis the the same the same way. So. Um, for example, you know, working with Twist, uh, the early thing that we figured out, uh, you know, in that partnership was um, we were actually sending, um, they used to have an Excel form where you can send your genes. And this works for if you're a PhD at the lab, you can like copy and paste in the Excel form, send it in. Um, we were uh, running over the maximum attachment size for email with the <laughs> orders they were trying to send to Twist. So that, that didn't work. So what we did is we went back to the drawing board and we set up an API. So today... Um, a engineer at Ginkgo needs to drive a DNA design uh, to uh, to Twist. They enter it in our design software. Our API talks to their API. You know all the you know synthesis checks, you know quoting, etc. You know that's all taken care of by the API, and then our DNA synthesis team receives a barcoded plate back, and it moves smoothly into to the rest of the process. So these are the things that you only run into once you commit to that kind of scale. I think it was important for us to just like commit to that infrastructure because now it's a lot easier for us to do that. Can I ask your question on that? So when you commit yeah. to this large scale order, yeah. you're saying like your vision is roadmap of the future. I mean, some countries have like Moore's law, very clearly improvements happen yeah. every single year repeated. Yeah. Are we seeing the same thing in DNA from this? I haven't seen what those curves look like yeah. in the last five years. Yeah, you know, I think there's uh like I said, I think there's like a bottomless appetite for for scale, right? Like the world I want to live in uh, is where uh, where DNA is is basically free, right? And like, you know, if you think about like things like DNA data storage, like a lot of Applications open up when you reach that that kind of that kind of scale, um, you know. So so for us, we absolutely have have planned around that. I think yeah, there are some like real barriers in terms of where the current chemistry can go, right? right? So I think very excited to see where where kind of enzymatic you know synthesis goes on that front. What I like about enzymatic synthesis too is like you can use biology to make the process better, right? So like you know think of like applying you know, something like Ginkgo's foundry to the enzymes used yeah. in enzymatic DNA synthesis, you can actually, you know, have a self-improving loop there. So I think, you know, we're nowhere near kind of 
like where we should be, um, you know, on that front. And yeah, anyway, I'm excited to see the right. innovation in that space because I think there's yeah endless you know room for improvement. So I guess the question I was sort of asking is like you know if you can pre-commit to like a billion base yeah. like in the semiconductor industry, you commit to building a gigantic fab. Yeah. You know, just because of the cost cap we put in there, you can yeah. drive down the cost. Yeah. Are we at that place for DNA synthesis where more capital will automatically move into the process or we have at sort of where the chemistries are at? Yeah, uh, yeah. More yeah. It's, I think it's, yeah, I, I think about it, like this is an area where it's very similar to chip foundries, right? Where, you know, if you can basically, uh, rather than kind of investing in the factory itself, you basically have a supply agreement for the, you know, basically a pre-agreed supply agreement that helps front the capital mm -hmm. for the land facility. So I think, you know, finding the right kind of process step changes that you can invest in, just the way like, you know, moving from <laughs> like 15 nanometers to 13 nanometers in the chip industry, like that seems like a model that that makes sense to me. Um, but like you, like you said, you kind of have to have a conviction that that next process node is yeah. gonna drive that kind of right. I guess that's my question, yeah. yeah. I don't know where that is. Maybe that's yeah. what you guys want. You wanna dive in that? Sure. Yeah. No, that's fine. It's just, I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> you told us we're going to be free and I'm glad we are. I think we actually have an audience question on that point. Yeah. So just give us time, please. Yeah. So, um, Patrick, it's really cool to hear you talk about sort of how Gateco sort of interfaces with DNA synthesis providers and how you build it into your business model for the scale. Um, we all know that benchtop devices are coming online and kind of potentially changing the game. I'm curious to know from your perspective, from the perspective of a panelist, like, how do you guys see benchtop DNA synthesis affecting your respective business models or not? Like, does it, is it a tool that will be useful to you? Or are you going to pivot in that direction or is it irrelevant? Um, you know, I think for, for me, like what I'm looking for at benchtop is, is it solving, you know, one of the dimensions around turnaround time or, or cost? For me, like form factor is not, not like, again, I don't even like to think about like physical DNA, right? It's like, I want designs going to experiments, right? Um, you know, so, so for me, like the machine that that passes through is less relevant than like, am I improving on one of those, one of those dimensions? Um, you know, I think from that perspective, like, you know, for me, like if you can achieve desktop synthesis, that means you're also achieving breakthroughs that, that apply at that scale as well. So like, that's really what I'm looking for there is the underlying chemistry that enables that. Does it also help on the scale front? <coughs> Yeah, I certainly take an agnostic uh, view to this. Um, we don't find that a lot of customers so far want to actually deploy in-house. Um, there are some exceptions to that. Very large pharmas, for example, want, want a degree of control. But most of the other customers that we're working with are not begging for deployable instrumentation. We have capability that could, could go there, but they're not actually asking for it. So it's just what we're seeing. I think that if there was something off the shelf that did what we needed to do, we would definitely like invest. And so what we've you know, done, you know, uh, internally is is build it ourselves, you know, and DNA synthesis for us. Uh, not not like we're still uh, buying fragments and then assembling in house basically uh, to cut down on uh, that turnaround time and get a higher um, success rate. So 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 much of our our DNA, we need really long fragments and they, they fail at synthesis and we have to bring them out in-house and clone. So the, the thing that we're trying to solve uh, in-house is, is, is plasmid construction. Um, and uh, if you could do that with a benchtop device, like, yes. And at the scale we need and the throughput. But if, is that a stopgap though or would you do that if those were available on the service provider? I mean, you, do you really want to adopt that instrumentation? That I, I want the turnaround time. I yeah. want my DNA. So if yeah. like so if it gets down on that, yeah. Yeah. I don't think any customer it's really cares how it's done. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I would rather just think about it and just yeah. focus yeah. on the biological part. Well, yeah. we want to abstract. The, the, yeah. like, you're, like you're saying, like the, the whole goal is that the entirety of of cloning. I remember a classmate of mine at MIT used to say, you know, one day in synthetic biology, we'll stop talking about our cloning methods <laughs> yeah. in, our, in our PhD defenses. And I think we, we're, I think we're probably there. I'm into a defense in a few years, but I think we're probably done talking about cloning methods. I'd actually like to be far enough to like not even think about the DNA. Of course, yeah. I think that's what's cool about Ginkgo's foundry model. Has always impressed me of like the you know, designs into a centralized flow into you know different differential experimentation, right? And on benchtop again, like I've I've seen some of the different models for companies doing these like benchtop synthesis models. I think that the economics that makes sense actually is more to to your side is where are we doing the most bespoke work that like a contractor is either not going to be able to do or they're going to do it kind of slowly because it's different than what their core thesis is as a company. 
And if they're really good at making oligos and strands of DNA and everything, I don't really need to do that in my already crowded with CapEx workspace and crowded with people. I don't need to take on that extra bench space to do this thing that probably, you know, IDT and, and not to talk about IDT, but, you know, I, I'm sorry. Uh, IDT and others like within the space that I'm, you know, most familiar with using, like their, their, their turnaround times on like their core product, super great. So then if I can augment that, drop it into my chassis, do the different, uh, you know, assemblies, on you know a Hamilton robot or some other or OpenTron or something else that's in our lab, but that's going to be much more efficient for automation workflows. Yeah, you know I think it's just a recurring theme here is like yeah you don't want to hear about cloning anymore in PhD thesis. <laughs> like you know this is this should not be an integral part of your if you're trying to make a product with synthetic biology like how you get your DNA like you should spend time on making sure you're getting the right access to DNA, but like how you build it like hopefully that just that just goes away. Right, and I, I think it's you know important that we kind of obsess about that because it is like. It is also makes it harder to for outsiders to kind of access what we're doing in synthetic biology. Like they don't want to hear about like how you're making plasmas. They want to hear about the therapeutics that you're that you're making, right? And you know, for me, like you know, something like a desktop synthesizer. Like I'd have to think about how that fits into the throughput of the rest of our facility. It would actually be a bottleneck, right? So like you know, I, I think it's just uh, you know, yeah, don't take pride in terms of how you make your DNA. Like it's, it's kind of like. Um, it's kind of like, you know, starting a tech company now and taking pride in, like, building your own servers, right? Like, you know, AWS is there, right? So I, I think it's just, we have to kind of move beyond, like, cloning as, like, a point of pride. I know it was, like, oh, we, we built that. I think we yeah. have to yeah. move beyond yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Older synthetic biologists, you know, <laughs> as, a, as a team builder, too, and, and ensuring, like, the longevity of my organization, like, uh, I'm super protective of the science and the scientists and the people <coughs> fail and the creativity, like, you know, DNA synthesis is not the problem that we're trying to yeah. solve. We're trying to solve, you know, human disease. And to, I really want the team to focus on that and this to be just, yeah, I, I totally agree. It's, it's a solved problem and something you don't have to worry about. And spend your precious PhD thinking about really different hard problems. DNA synthesis is still a hard problem, different hard problems that we I think you talk to old school computer scientists, they always want to talk to you about DOS and how they just use DOS. <laughs> You're like, I don't give a shit about dogs. Like, <laughs> that's cool. It sounds really hard. I'm glad you were able to make it do things. But, yeah. you know, it's not helpful now to computer science to know how to use dogs. And I, I think cloning and other things like that can go you know, sort of by the wayside and be isolated. Yeah, I was it. jealous of your PhD generation. You got Gibson assembly. Like oh, yeah. 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 So we, got, we got Gibson right before I came to PhD, <laughs> my PhD. So it, was, it helped a lot. <laughs> uh, and we've talked at this point about throughput. We've talked Length. Tim, you want to talk to us a little bit about complexity in the gene circuitry and next gen synthesis space? Yeah, I think, well, I think traditionally that's been one of the big bottlenecks in the space in trying to create you know, long, highly complex DNA and repetitive patterns, especially if you start doing stuff that involves, you know, hysteric organisms or even a bunch of human sequences that you may want to recapitulate to involve those sort of things. And a lot of the traditional processes fail in that, or what manual processes are super frustrating if you try to do it yourself. Um, so that, I think, to us, is, continues to be a place where we struggle sometimes when we're, where we're asking a provider to make long sequences for us, off, you know, that we, we, we don't want to think about what is in there, but, you know, oftentimes that does still need to play a role, I think, in, uh, in, in, in the, the sort of suppliers that we're using and the way they're actually making it. Well, I think at this point we've heard about a number of the bottlenecks. Matt, do you want to tell us where things are today and to be some of the work you're doing to overcome them? Yeah. So I share a very similar vision to the folks in the back, which is nobody should have to care about where the DNA comes from. You want to be able to snap your fingers and just have it show. Do your designs, place your order, have that stuff show up as quickly as possible. And and this is, you know, when I entered the field, so again, you know, I come from the diagnostics world, I ran into DNA synthesis problems uh, just for all of us. We were you know, to come from my previous company, I won't get into the details, but we were pioneers of some very, very high multiplex type assays. We're talking about 20,000 plus single tube reactions. And even those oligos took us six to eight weeks just to get that many oligos, let alone genes. Um, and so that was sort of planted the seed in my head around 2010, 2011 time frame. Like, this is it. No one has solved this problem. It's pretty amazing. I, I wasn't even working in synthetic biology. Uh, and I got fascinated by the field and wanted to enter the space and realized in 2016, 2017, we're not progress. And we're still talking about gene fragments and single gene type constructs, which take and maybe some Gibson assembly. And some Gibson assembly, yeah, it's a great technique, but okay. but you're you're assembling you know you're assembling you know 
thousand base fragments and the longer things, and you know, the, the industry had sort of solved the, you know, the, sort of solved the oligos to an initial fragment step, but that's as far as it went, 2017 timeframe. And the vision behind Elgin was this isn't no single technology was going to solve the entire problem. I think this has been some of the sort of, in my opinion, you know, you can't solve a complex additive multi-step manufacturing process, and I'm sure Dinko, you know this really well. It's a multi-step process. You can't solve it using a single innovation. You actually have to innovate many different steps of the process in order to bring efficiency, bring length, bring quality, bring accuracy. And so that's what we're doing at LG. And so the idea is to deliver the community DNA as long as you want, you know, the, the long-term vision as long as you want, arbitrary complexity, very fast, at a reasonable price. And we are we're already on the market today with 7 kb DNA in seven days with an error rate of 170,000 per base error rate, which is about 20 times better than typical gene. And, uh, and we're just getting started at uh, tomorrow. And maybe today and right now I'm announcing <laughs> an early access program to DNA that's uh, up to 20 kb in a couple of weeks, pure clonal, as well as uh, enhanced complexity. So complexity that uh, far exceeds what you get from the typical gene tracks. Now, just selfishly with privacy, like, do you scale that with length, or is it sort of like, well, we have a 7 kb product, and then we have this early access 10 kb product, and pretty much that has a cost? Because I mean, with with I other suppliers, over to <laughs> uh, it, it, It's been, you know, sort of gated on length, and then sometimes, especially with new technologies, I remember when IDP announced their 4 kb G-block, it was still cheaper to just order a bunch of 1 kb G-blocks and assemble them in your lab. It's an assembly. Um, you know, yeah, but that's what you need to know about how much that costs to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's the tricky part. And, yeah, and yeah, I don't that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah. pricing models, we can discuss yeah. that on. <laughs> No, but I'm just wondering but, how you guys yeah. think about that. Like, is it a yeah. rapid increase as you increase that length, or is there something that's... Um, we have efficiencies. Our, okay. our, so we have innovated at a, at a bunch of the steps that allow us to bring efficiencies to the DNA production process. So our costs, uh, you know, uh, they scale reasonably with the length. Okay. Um, and, and so it's not, you don't have this large step function. And it is true that if you use some of the traditional techniques, look, a lot of the traditional suppliers are still using very traditional... Approaches that there's not a lot of and the tricky part is there's not a lot of there hasn't been a lot of innovation around the, a lot of the different steps that are involved. It's it's figuring out how to scale your own biofoundry as opposed to really innovating around the methods that you use. So our DNA, for example, we don't ever touch a cell. Our seven kb DNA does not touch a cell, and yet we're able to deliver essentially clonal DNA from that process, and that allows us to bring scalability in the process. That um, so you, you really do have to innovate, and I think there's been a lack of really sound innovation across the steps that matter. And so that's where I would argue. Elegen is unique in that we've looked at the system as a whole, and we are with laser focus going and changing the steps that actually are causing these types of outcomes that we're seeing. And I mean, we've heard, Patrick, you were mentioning in somatic, which helps in chemical bacterial production and scale up for purification. Uh, do you want to share a little bit more about how you do it? Um, we won't necessarily get into all the deep methods about how um, but, uh, our approach, but we don't use an end the back approach. We view that as entirely complementary, and I'm um, more than happy to see that technology take off. But we don't actually need end the back chemistry. End the back chemistry is great, and it potentially produces very high quality, longer oligos, but it doesn't actually get you to a gene uh, or anything longer than a gene uh, to get the types of error rates that you get to more than 70,000. Actually, need other steps, and it doesn't matter. We're currently using. Is the, sort of the first foundational step to our process. So we don't need to give a high quality. It's not to say that it's not helpful in some ways or others. No, but if you have an agnostic platform, it's great, and then we're just that it can take it forward. But I think our panelists who would be themselves using it, if you have any questions from that, I guess while we're here. <laughs> I, 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 would actually, yeah. I would like to, you know, Ginkgo is, I mean, you guys have done an amazing job building out your own internal production capability, but. Most companies don't have the capital resources that you have, and, and so we are, you know, we are trying to sort of democratize that in a sense. Uh, other groups should be able to do what Ginkgo is doing in some respects, not to 
yeah, for dumb competitors, but <laughs> <laughs> but other folks should be able to do what you're doing without spending you know whatever it may have cost for your bio founder. And and, and the interesting thing that I see, of course, is as a founder with technology, most people don't think about what it costs to actually build out and staff and run these internal bio founders. I mean, I know there's a there's been a fixation on price over years and very cognizant that price matters, but there's a fixation on price, but you're taking, you know, if you're buying these low quality fragments and you're building out an internal bio foundry to assemble all this DNA, it is probably costing you far more than you realize. Yeah. You know, upwards of 30, 40, 50 cents per base in many cases, because you're not running at the efficiency of Ginkgo. I, mean, I don't want to compare the prices with Ginkgo, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, most people are not with that kind of efficiency. So if you're running a process once a week and yet you've got a half million dollar Echo, Hamilton, whatever your automation is, system is, you're, you're spending a lot of money on that DNA. Well, I, I think that's like key to how our industry keeps scaling, right? It's like, you know, like, again, like, you don't want to build your own server farms and use AWS, right? Like, you know, Ginkgo has spent a lot of capital to build our infrastructure because we want everyone to use it and benefit from it. Same thing with, with DNA synthesis. So, like, you know, basically every, if you're starting a company in some biology, every dollar that you're spending on rebuilding a pipeline that that you can probably outsource from elsewhere is a dollar that you take away from applying to your product, right? And I think it's it's hard for those of us who did our PhDs in synthetic biology to kind of let go of, of like some of the stuff that was like really key to us understanding enough about the technology to like get into it in the first place. But like, you know, the impact that, you know, our partner companies have is, is in terms of getting their products out there. So if I can provide a clean interface, you know, to help them focus on their on their product and they're not worried about, like you said, like, you know, you shouldn't be worried about the quality of the DNA you're getting, right? You can check that box, so like you can free up those brain cells to work on your actual product, right? So that's good. Okay. We've talked a lot about where we are today. Do you guys want to project forward, think about where we're going? Maybe in this world of when DNA is effectively free, when you can just get it on demand once it's been synthesized? I mean, I think it fits into this broader trend that we're seeing, it feels like, you know, biology is really about determining a lot of work we see in biology is determining how sequence translates the function, where you see machine learning methods basically trying to solve that problem, and we need experimental substrate to solve that problem, which is really powered ultimately by these DNA synthesis type of technologies. So I see I think it's like a perfect time in the field for these two complementary areas to be developing. Um, you know, the more data that we can generate in you know, large scale, it's going to power our understanding of these systems um, at a high level. And I think the other side of it is like, Obviously, DNA sequencing is far, still far outstripping you know, anything we can ever make. And I think that actually is helping us also on this data collection issue. You know, the fact that we can sequence the heck out of huge amounts of data just means that there's just more stuff to tap into. Um, so I, I agree. I think the sort of the demand for synthesis of sequencing is nowhere near where we think it's going to be in the next 10 years. And the computational side is also going to be a large driver of this that takes away a lot of that human design on like Microsoft Word or even thinking about like, Know, exactly what changes I need to make. We automate that design process more and more as we go forward. We've actually hired our, our first group of uh, genetic circuit designers who don't work with the genetic sequence. So we have a number of people now because of some computational infrastructure that we built for the company. I was talking with some folks and realizing that our, our infrastructure got to the point that some of our synthetic biologists actually don't even directly have to interact with the mRNA sequences that we have. And that to me is one, wild, but two, like a, an introduction into where I think that we're going, where we have composable circuit architectures um, within various companies. I'm sure you guys already have stuff like this at Ginkgo where you're just moving parts around and optimizing them. But, and then being able to back that into like how sequence and, and performance relates. Um, I remember when we hired our first computational, like head of biocomputation, I was like, I want to study how mRNA sequence in the non-coding regions influences the expression. And he was like, okay, do you have any idea, if you want to use machine learning, how much data you need to generate here? Like, he's like, you don't have this data, you don't have enough money to generate this data. And now with the falling cost of synthesis and also more of these high throughput systems, I think we're seeing Actually can't I think that's one really interesting think philosophically to think about. Like I've been in the field for a bit of time. Where like the initial thinking of this field, perhaps a little bit on the simplistic side, was that we would have bricks, right? We're going to click them together and each of them are modular. And I think, I mean, from an assembly perspective, that made sense. But we kind of assumed at that point function was going to translate the same way. It's clearly not. But I do think that with some of these new methodologies, we have enough data at least that we can generate that even though that's not true, 
we can still try to design systems that um, sort of take those interactions into account. Um, so I think that's a really exciting time to be in the field because even if we don't, I don't think any of us here really knows how to engineer a truly modular biological system yet, um, at least heuristically, we can probably start getting there. Um, and so I think that's the first step in trying to understand and, and, and program biology in a much more rational way. Yeah, I'd say, yeah, the 10 years of our abstractions around modularity for design are still connected to the underlying DNA. We're doing something Yeah, no, that for sure. So, <laughs> you know, that shouldn't actually be modular, right? Because yeah. biology right. doesn't yeah. work that way. Right. You see that, matter, you see yeah. this in protein engineering, right? Someone's like, well, I want this protein, this protein does X and this protein does Y. And if I stick them together with a flexible linker, then it will do X plus Y. Mm -hmm. And that's that's been going on for like 20 years. And it goes through clinical trials and then oh, turns out like a flexible linker wasn't the answer. And of course it wasn't, because when you see a, a, a bifunctional protein in the wild, it doesn't have a, a GS linker in the middle of its two functional groups. Okay. It has a whole structured region, and people are like, well, I don't know what that region does, so I guess it's just a linker. And it's like, no, it's not. You just don't understand it. Yeah. And hopefully, I think, in the future, in, as far as synthetic biology goes, the modularity of design will exist from an abstract pers perception, right. yeah, but when it yeah. becomes compiled, it yeah. actually compiles in a way that works well together and integrates, both yeah. from protein engineering and probably more so, and maybe even easier to do from the genetic side when we do DNA and mRNA based sequence design. So yeah, you're really getting to compiling, right? Yeah, like an actual yeah. compiler, not just like, <coughs> like right. copy paste right. like all these pieces <laughs> together. Like that's it's sort of archaic. It's kind of wild. We still do that. It's 2023. <laughs> <laughs> How much time do we have? Uh, I think we've got about 15 minutes. Okay. So, if there are, yeah. I, I have one follow-up thought. Yeah. I just wanted to do a quick time check. So, I, so this is actually why I got into this in the first place. I mean, it really, really is bringing agile development for programmability to biology. And the truth is, is, you know, we're still in this, you know, people talk about punch cards. We're actually earlier than that, in my opinion. We're like plug board. Like, this is any. That was just like plug board biology. We kind of sort of know, but you have to kind of like test things out to see if things work. Punch cards are something to actually have like a real capability. We're not there yet in biology. We are really, really terrible at programming biology for these reasons, right? Uh, it, it's like this, you know, you've got you've got a language, you've got the ability to code, and yet you don't understand the compiler or what the language really is. So we're having to figure out at the same time. And it, therefore iteration is the only solution as well. It, it's being able to look and do this over and over and over and over again as fast as you possibly can for a reasonable cost. And that's the real solution to this sin bio revolution. And until we solve that, this will never happen. And so this was the so the raison d'etre uh, for Elegy is to start to bring speed and iterative uh, detail. At this point, I no longer am running the panel you guys are. <laughs> so should I turn it over for questions? Or a little bit more thought. I mean, I totally agree with that. I think as you guys um, <laughs> Basically, get more and more successful at solving that bottleneck. I think the other bottleneck that I don't, there's not a lot of discussion about, is the assays and the sort of readout become the true bottleneck. Like, you know, we're doing a lot of therapeutic development work. Our ability to build constructs, even though it's still constrained, is like far outstripping our ability to like test them in animals, for example. Um, so I, I, I do think that, at least on the therapeutic side, trying to, trying to build better assays that are actually accurate human models of disease will be one of the sort of major challenges for the field. And, Next five ten years, if we're going to try to realize these productivities, could you not leverage the same approach to develop new models? I mean, if you're talking about, I would hope sensors so, yeah. out circuits. Yeah, but I guess the question is like, how do you make sure that whatever thing you're creating artificially does actually match the human model? That's just really hard to, you know, um, in, a, in a short time. Audience, questions? Yeah, yeah. question for our lovely panel. Okay. Well, no. um, um, I was, uh, uh, so we've been talking a lot about adding the scale, but then, of course, I think there is another aspect that probably we touched upon, is about uh, scaling up on the amounts of DNA. So I guess a lot of these uh, enzymatic uh, amazing technologies, I mean, they're providing a lot of high throughput uh, synthesis of many animals, but when it comes to pharma, the pharma that uses the DNA as the end product, then they use high quality DNA at scale to work the uh, research. Yeah. What are your thoughts about that? Um, <coughs> we are we are developing strategies to, to, to do this. And actually you can feel free to reach out to us. But we have strategies to actually scale up the DNA to gram scale. 
So imagine it's very high quality multi kilobyte scheme at a ground scale and not a from de novo, so de novo sequence, totally custom DNA at gram scale. Uh, these are things yeah. coming coming down the pipe. Well, and that's a great example of like infrastructure that I'd love not to have to build. Like particularly as we uh, we do a lot more work supporting pharma now. Uh, we basically, you know, had to build our own automation to support endotoxin free purification of uh, DNA, right? Um, one of the nice things about never touching a cell is that if you can provide endotoxin free DNA in the first place, going back to the plasma trap, you know, discussion from before, I think that's mm -hmm. that's a game changer, right? Like, uh, you know, anyway, like, you know, if you're spending a lot of time and money purifying away stuff that was <laughs> never important to begin with for yeah. um, for your product, uh, yeah, that's that's a pain. And I think that if you have a process, we talked about length, scaling price, but you have a process that like scales price when you scale up, not in a way that is exponential, right? Because this is another thing with uh, you know, <clears throat> large scale, high quality like DNA and other sorts of nucleic acid production is like you go from what you go from. 500 milligrams to one gram to 10 grams. Because you switch regimes. Yeah, they, yeah, it switches the and, 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 and they, they change rapidly, right? They, yeah. And they change aggressively. Well, and that, and that infrastructure, and that infrastructure is very, it's very traditional, right? You, you switch from a you know, PCR type synthetic regime into, you've got now the fermenters with bugs, right? And, yeah. and that is a, that is a fundamental change in the manufacturing process. That has lots of sort of interstitial costs associated just because you're allocating very expensive equipment for a dedicated period of time. And that cost has you know, companies that do this sort of thing have to pass those costs on to the customers. There are other strategies to get there. Do you think that your scale up will, in terms of pricing, not to want to win anything here, but will actually achieve economies of scale? Because a lot of that scale up, right, like e even if it's on an exponential increase when you increase the volume or the mass that you're trying to get. It's it's there's no economy of scale. If I if I get one gram of DNA or I get ten grams of DNA, that's a ten x increase in price at the best case, right? There's no like, hey, you order, you know, if I order, if I buy a whole box of bananas, it's cheaper than buying one banana, right? Well, but, right now you have a super, you you really do have a more of a geometric or exponential increase because you're yeah. changing the yeah. hardware in which you operate on our approach, and it's um, it, it is hard to get away from at least some linear. But linear yeah. is better than exponential. Yeah. The linear increase is, is a consequence of the fact that you, you have to you still have to feed some amount of reagents into this process and they have a base cost. But you're not exponential. Yeah. So, okay. so you, you can expect a linear increase in in scale versus cost. <laughs> <laughs> We're not negotiating price. <laughs> I'm just curious. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> but, but there's an opportunity. To, there's an opportunity to disrupt that. Yeah, I just wonder because I don't know what technology you're using to scale it, but like if there is a possibility at some point that like you, that the technology does have an economies of scale where it's not just the cogs that are dictating the price, right? That's that's the difference, right? Where the process efficiency yeah. at larger scales can can lower the price because you're not just saying, well, these are the cogs. And this is, I don't know. we'll talk about it later. Well, well, that's, well, interesting. that's interesting. I can say it's there, which is, as, as you switch as you switch over into that. To that infrastructure to make you know fermenters and large vat production of things, and I don't know if Ginkgo is doing this in house, but you switch into a regime where just the equipment costs, even a single batch run with the engineering batches associated with this, puts you in to hundreds of thousands of dollars for initial runs, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, it doesn't need to be that way. Yeah. Okay. For, for us, we've uh, it's been cost competitive to build in house the margin. That's how it's been. They didn't make sense to do it. Having it linear would be good. Sure. Were there any other questions from the audience? No. Sorry, I wanted that. I wanted to, I wanted to hold, having it linear. This is the other interesting thing that I will say we're seeing, you know, because we're out there selling linear DNA. And, and actually, one of the conversations we always have is, but it's not plasma. That's what we. So we get this, we use, and a lot of customers, I mean, it's experience, but a lot of folks sort of entrenched thinking is that everything's got to be a plasma. I challenge that assumption, why, why? Why do you have to be a plasma or DNA? If you're going through a plasmid, and that's taking you four to six weeks, potentially longer, to get to that plasmid DNA, and then you are doing some sort of digestion and or amplification process on that plasmid, you're ending up with DNA that is lower quality 
yeah. has a higher error rate than the DNA that we are the long DNA that we should be using. Ideally, ideally, there is no E. coli in uh, yeah. us, right. uh, we're dealing with super novel uh, genes that are often toxic to E. coli, and we'll never know, you know, if they're going to be a great thing for you because you can't close so them. So I'd rather like avoid E. coli. Yeah, I mean, you know, it really is just math, right? If you're going, if you're going straight to the genome at the right error rate, like it doesn't matter if it goes through a plasma or not. Like, you just like how many clones do you have to pick to get the right the right thing? And you just it's error rate. How many clones do you care about? That, that's it, right? Uh, for protein engineering, again, like linear DNA is great because, like, cloning, like I said, it slows us down, right? And where the real thing is, like, how many iterations can you get through? Um, you know, again, like, you can actually live with error rate. Maybe you, act, maybe you actually, if you have a selection for your enzyme, maybe actually one of those errors is actually beneficial and you find it that way, right? You build your process around kind of the error rate they can tolerate. See, it seems to me that the discussion around cost is more because we're not really doing something on an industrial scale. We're kind of going up from something past academic into a pilot. But to really go industrial, it's a billion dollar facility, right? You're talking like insulin isn't just you know something somebody scaled up. The building and the facility was a billion dollars, not to mention all the reagents and everything else. So. I think it's tough right now for the way where synthetic biology is to have to make that argument. Cost-wise, it may not be competitive, but it's because we haven't figured out exactly what are the things we have to make on scale and committed ourselves to making those and setting up a huge market for it. I mean, there's a few products that are done on scale. When you look at them, it's a heroic effort, like vanilla, right? That's that was a major effort, huge, two different two different biological systems and um, so I'm so I'm not so worried about the cost in that way I want access and the ability to try to figure it out as fast as I can just like you said the gene editing putting them together hey if it worked with if I have one string and it worked can I just keep on putting those on there and get that thing puffing them out it, it just doesn't work it's right it's like we're not we don't quite understand it well enough. But, but I actually am still worried about it because a lot of times with these next generation therapeutics with this, and this is why I think what you're getting at without us talking about specifics actually sounds really interesting to me because it might scale a lot better than a lot of our bioproduction is right now. Because right now you have entire teams, process development teams working on scale up and it's 10,000 times more complex than chemical, I was a chemical engineer. Uh, before I was a biological engineer. And that scale up has 150 years of people learning how do you scale up from a reaction vessel to, to a CSTR to an industrial tank reactor. But biology is like a new problem every time you do yeah. it. And if you're making viruses, you're making mRNA, I mean, take the mRNA vaccines, for example, they didn't scale those up, they scaled them out. Mm -hmm. They just did the same thing mm -hmm. that they were doing for phase one a bunch of other times because that was more efficient. If you actually scaled up, you would have dropped efficiency, you would have had all sorts of end stage products. And so, yeah, have we not scaled it up? But some of these things, like, do they even scale up correctly? Oncolytic viruses never scaled up correctly and those got approved and they had Amgen behind them and they couldn't figure out how to make TVEC profitable, like from a COGS perspective. So some of these things just simply don't scale and we need biological innovation not process, because some of the process innovation just isn't going to be there for some of these next generation therapeutics. Oh. And that's why we have wonderful people like, like these two here working on stuff. Like well, I think, you know, one of the kind of secrets of this industry is like, why is it so hard to scale up? It's because people are trying to scale bad organisms or bad processes, mm -hmm. right? And, and, you know, coming back to, to, to DNA synthesis, one of the reasons why I think that's so important to driving the industry forward is like, why do, like, it's not like people know, like, just want to scale bad organisms. It's that they feel like once you have something that's working just good enough, it's time to go to commercial scale and like get that product out there, right? Um, because the iteration of the lab scale is so, so expensive, right? So for me, like leveraging like boundary scale biology, leveraging access to cheap and scalable DNA synthesis means we can do more work to get it right the first time. Um, and when you have a good organism that's well designed, scale up actually isn't that, that bad, right? But a lot of people are just trying to get stuff to market or something else not ready. All right, I think that's a great note to end up on. <laughs> <laughs>